the opportunity to be with everybody here today at this awesome gathering. And thank you for the opportunity to look deeply into my own creative practice and be able to share my thoughts with you today. Special thanks go to Martha Giberson, Jelva Jeff. Uh, Karen Sweezy, Susan Richards, and Mike Gannon for bringing everything together for me. So what sparks ideas? How does an artist's vision progress from an unsubstantial concept to an object that we can hold in our hands? Where do you get ideas? It's usually the first question that an artist is asked. And it may be obvious, or it may be very elusive. I'm fascinated with creativity and imagination, whether it's in artwork, science, inventions, or children playing. So in preparation for this talk, I look back at my past lectures and other work that I've done, and I realized that fascination with the creative process has been a reoccurring theme in the expo my exploration of both the library's resources and my own work. <coughs> so if you've taken a behind the scenes tour with me, inspiration, you would have seen um, You probably heard me talk about our paintings by the Tiffany girls. They're one of my favorites. This one by Alice Gouvet is from 1900. That's the dandelions. And the other is by Lillian Palme, about 1900. Lewis Comfort Tiffany hired women to run his enameling department. They either created or invented his stained glass lamps, desk accessories, and other smaller items. When not producing product, these women were encouraged to paint wildflowers they saw in the fields or the forest. Not as design drawings. We found no Tiffany products that used these images. Instead, the girls pinned the large drawings on their studio walls for inspiration. Both photographs and period correspondence correspond uh, confirms this. Tiffany's girls found value in escaping routine to explore, to sketch, to paint, to renew, as juice for creativity. And I love this story. Fostering inspiration has value, but as you know, it's difficult to make time in our busy lives. But what is the cost to us if we don't make that time? Today I'll start my own journey, uh, with my own journey with glass, my background, my teachers, the experiences that were catalysts to my interest in glass, this fascinating material. I found that art inspires me, and artists inspire me as well. And I'll share some of what I've learned from them. I'll show you how I move from the first spark or idea to the finished piece, and how making is often problem solving, a process that requires thoughtful working through of every step. And I'll share some of the stories behind my sculpture and jewelry. So I've been intrigued with glass since childhood. My father was an engineer at Corning Glassworks, and I remember touring the factory with him in Kentucky watching glowing gobs of glass shoot through a massive pressing machine. My great aunt Tilly worked at the Elegance Ben Shop in Studia and Corning, and she introduced me to the magic of sparkling Studen, the Museum of Glass Galleries, the Hall of Science, and the lamp workers <coughs> creating fancy glass. I collected a menagerie of tiny glass animals and even my Barbie doll had glass, optical glass tables. <laughs> Even then. After my family moved to Corn in New York in my senior year in high school, I could visit the museum more often. And in college, I spent two summers as a tour guide 
welcoming visitors, answering questions, and narrating in the Stuben factory. One of the curators, Jane Spillman, would stop and chat with me when she discovered my interest in librarianship. And she took me across the street to the library to talk to Virginia Wright and Norma Jenkins. And then they advised me over lunch at a picnic table. And I was convinced I wanted to work in a museum library. After graduate school, a temporary job was available in the library. But I never dreamed I would stay for 40 years and become a glassmaker myself. As many of you know, I'm one of the librarians at the Corning Museum of Glass Ray Cal Research Library, and I'll call it SEMA. I started as acquisitions librarian, and can you imagine? My job was to buy any book anywhere in the world about glass. <laughs> any kind of glass. <laughs> so about 100 books and catalogs a month came through my hands about any type of glass you can imagine. <laughs> So it could be ancient mosaics, beads and buttons, inkwell, scientific glass, telescopes, mirrors, light bulbs. Um, I was addicted. And when I wasn't processing books, I was answering people's questions about glass. And reference librarian continues to be my title today, where I delve deeply into those books to find answers to questions or to give clues to people so they can find their own answers. Sooner or later, the glass world comes to Corning, and we have the incredible opportunity to talk with researchers, students, and contemporary glass artists about their work. And I was lucky to work at the museum when it was small enough that I could be immersed in every aspect Today, the staff is about 300, and we're a little more siloed. Wow. But in 1978-79, there were only 30 of us. We were in temporary quarters while the Gruner Burkitts building was being built. And we all had lunch together and chatted with the curators and everyone else about their research, new acquisitions, the museums they visited. And I learned a lot about that. In the new building, the architect placed the library in the center with the museum galleries wrapped around us. Burkitts believed that without the historical information in the library, the glass was meaningless. But once the, li the library materials were in place, we assisted the curators as they filled the gallery shelves. And normally librarians don't get a chance to handle the glass, but the registrar and the curators trained us and I worked with Sidney Goldstein as he placed ancient glass in the cases and told me stories about each piece. He is an amazing teacher. And that's when I touched 2,000-year-old Roman glass, and the iridescence really did come off on my fingers. Not very much. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time also that during that time cleaning glass shells with diapers, so <laughs> it was to work doing everything. But glass is tactile. You gain so much knowledge by touching. Visiting museums to see the best is great, but visit a gallery or an artist studio where the staff may put a piece into your hands. Feel the weight, the texture, the evidence of making. Absorb the piece through your senses. ISGB and the artists who participate give you that opportunity at the Bee Bazaar, so take advantage. 1979 was also my introduction to the Studio Glass Movement. The museum's exhibit, New Glass, a Worldwide Survey, was a revelation. I knew about Stuben, one too many, uh, formal, sparkling, and historical pieces, utilitarian tableware and vases. And as a tour guide in college, I remember three contemporary sculptures displayed on a ramp as you left the museum to enter the Hall of Science. It was Marvin Lepofsky's flock piece that stood out. I didn't like it, but it teased me. It, why the ugly colors? Why cover up the glass? Why? I later learned because it was Marvin, and in life as well as in art, he challenged you to reflect on his pieces. 
And back in 1979, our galleries were filled with challenging glass by early studio glassmakers from across the globe. The museum's exhibit introduced me to a new way of looking at glass, changing the expectation of what it could do, what it could look like, and what it could say. Glass was transformed from the beginning of the studio glass movement in 1962 to its blossoming in 1979. This unprecedented exhibit brought it all together, and the show traveled through Europe and Japan after pouring introducing new glass and the studio movement to artists, critics, and collectors. I'll show you a few of my favorites. I had an attraction to lamp working even then, so I love the squiggles in Whittemore's robot piece, Frabel's hammer, <laughs> and the anthem of joy in glass by Vera Lisbeth is still an inspiration to me. CMOG is celebrating the anniversary of this pivotal exhibit, so come to Corning this summer to see how glass has transformed again in the last 40 years. The 1979 Black Gas Glass Art Society Conference, my first, was held in Corning, and the museum staff were invited to join the lectures and the parties. At that point, I never thought I would be an artist myself and that the people on stage would become my friends. I've been lucky to join you and a number of ISGB conferences, first in Corning in 1998, and here we are at the Radisson and the CMOD studio. It's been important for me to bring information back to the library, to be able to understand and answer questions about everything from bead making to pot de verre to 3D printing, or whatever the newest trend is. Looking back, I see that making connections, seeing the best new work, learning about new techniques, inspired me to, on my own journey as an artist. My glass work making has also been in, influenced by dancing. <laughs> so I <laughs> took tap, ballet, and modern from age four well into my 40s with recitals every year. Training with Lois Wealth and the New York City artist she brought to Corning gave me freedom of expression and movement. Glass expresses gesture and movement, and when I melt for a silicate glass, stretch it into shape, then pause until the molten glass becomes solid. Any distraction shows up in the glass. The line can waver. You know that glass making really is a meditation, a dance, using your entire body and being, not just your hands. I recently watched David Sandage stitch a traditional sailing ship during a behind the glass of the Corning Museum of Glass. And each line swoops confidently as gesture is suspended, held motionless for several moments and it's captured in the glass itself. He has elegant control. And if you're interested, this is on YouTube, so you can find it there. So remember the flowing lines of Whittemore's molten squiggles. There really is fluidity in each twist and turn. You'll see those years of dance in my performance in uh, Laura Donifer's Glass Art Society fashion shows as well. The glass literally has to move with you as you dance across the stage to outrageous music. My boral branches broke the first time on stage, so I added a hinge, and the branch swings with, them, with me without breaking the gesture. <laughs> In the library, I have been advising artists on everything from how to build a furnace, creating molds, finding glass blowing tools, and I decided it was time for me to learn more about making glass and to try it myself. So, but this was 1988. There were no teaching workshops in the Corning <coughs> area. And schools like the Rochester Institute of Technology and Alfred University weren't interested in part-time <coughs> students. There was no place to practice in Corning. 
And at the museum, visitors watch the Stuvent factory workers and the lamp work workers make animals. But there was no hot glass show and no, me no demos. A friend, Nancy Trevesi, was creating stained glass and fusing at home. And she invited me to join her on weekends. Later, she used a hot head to make beads and joined ISGB. And she organized the bead exhibit in Corning in 1998. But I still wanted to blow glass at the furnace. So I traded a class at New York Experimental Glass Workshop on Mulberry Street in New York City. It's now Urban Glass in Brooklyn. And I indexed their magazine in exchange for beginning glass blowing weekends. One with James Harmon and a second class with John Grecky. And I was hooked. I loved the heat, loved the furnace, loved using my breath to expand the glass. I was terrible, but it was mesmerizing. <laughs> As a bonus in the same studio, Bill Budenrath was blowing his delicate Venetian goblets. So no staff member at the museum had ever touched molten glass. So I was really the first. And I returned eager to convince our community we needed a facility in Corning. And in 1990, Rody Rovner took the lead with 171 Cedar Art Center to establish the studio access to glass on Baker Street. I helped with anything that was needed and continued blowing glass. There, I took my first lamp working class <laughs> with my beginner beads uh, with Brian Kirkland. And working at the torch, I finally found my niche in glass. Brody's studio closed in September 1994, so several of us applied for a 300,000 grand, dollar grant from the Corning Foundation to start a new public access studio. CMOG was interested in hosting the facility and a new Corning Museum of Glass studio opened in 1996. That first year, I took classes with Sally Prosh and Susan Plum and switched to borosilicate glass. With Susan Plum, our first assignment was to make glass dowsing rods. Then she sent us outside to search for an object. I discovered a pine cone. And so for a week with Susan, I researched its symbolism and delved into my personal stories relating to seeds, spirals, and pine trees. After a lot of experimentation, I transformed my stories into this glass moment. It's pretty rough. But the whorls of the pine cone become a spiral of dancing creativity. The seeds became abstract hands and I still hang it over my workbench to invite imagination. This kind of research and exploration is still central to my practice. In that class, Susan experimented with making a small ball of borosilicate glass strands, leading to her sculpture of woven heaven, tangled earth, a three-foot diameter sphere of woven three-millimeter oil rod. For Susan, Glass is a metaphor for light, and the intricate strands represent the Mayan idea that heavens and earth are woven light, constantly untangled and re-energized by the shaman. With Sally Prosh, I gained solid grounding and technique, and so much more. I'm constantly inspired by her passionate expression of her beliefs. Her caring is vivid in her work. She's both my friend and my mentor. When my well runs dry, Sally's always there to fill me up again, and I hope it's beautiful. As Sally's teaching assistant, I've spent several weeks exploring new glass techniques and helping students at Pittsburgh, Penland, Tilchuk, Urban Glass, and the CMOD Studio. Sally encourages collaboration. And here I've worked with a fiber artist at Penland. And immersion in glass is rare and special for me. And it was at Pilchuck in 2001 that I first started thinking of myself, not as a librarian who dabbled in glass, but as an artist myself, as a means of uh, expression. 
With Sally, I've also attended American Scientific Glass Blowing Society meetings, learning about another type of making. And friends are so important to a creative life. And it's okay to ask for advice from those you admire. Once when Kathy Thompson was teaching at the studio, I brought my necklaces to her and asked for a critique. I'd known Kathy for a long time, so I was comfortable asking for her. But often, artists and teachers are willing to provide insight. Kathy suggested that I learn silver techniques to make my findings as unique as the glass. This piece still has the purchase caps, and you'll see later how that PMC added something. Um, it did give me the push to try PMC, precious metal clay, something I've been wishing to do. If you're interested in adding metal clay to your beads, Martha Bigger is an amazing and gifted teacher. She and Ed are teaching at Glass Craft this weekend, so you have an opportunity to see her and meet her. Learning a new technique can prompt you to see the world a little differently. For me, once I began using metal clay, a medium that highlights textures, Every walk around the neighborhood or hike at the nature center was transformed. My photo of a rock at Spencer Crest Trail became a photopolymer plate that I used to make these silver plate earrings. However, being mesmerized by details is new. I take photos of ripples in the sands, patterns on squash, ice on branches, frayed rope, fossils, but now I could turn those details into jewelry in a new way. This is terrain. It's not a photopolymer plate. I layered each slice of silver by hand. This is pebbles. I remember a boyfriend in college, a football player, biochemist, who was fascinated by my view of the world. Once again, I was focused on details, picking up bits and pieces along the sidewalk. And he gave me glittering, sparkly metal, mineral chunks because he thought of me when he saw them. <clears throat> so why did I pick up this hunk of decaying tree trunk when we were picnicking in the woods? And what prompted me to put it in an antique box and turn it into a waterfall sculpture? It drives my partner Brad nuts, but he's also pretty indulgent because eventually I'll use them on rusty metal bolts, feathers, stones, or leaves I collect into artwork, or at least some of them. <laughs> My mom collected quilts, and these remind me of her. Another with a nest and a silver feather. In fact, as I was writing this, Brad sent an article about the Museum of Everyday Life in Globe Vermont. It chronicles and highlights the mundane, the utilitarian, insignificant objects of our ex uh, existence and makes them remarkable. Well, that's my kind of museum. I also get inspiration from others in a different way. When friends see something old, weird, or wonderful, and they think, oh, that could do something with that. I was gifted with an antique microscope box and some more bird's nests recently. Red Cow Library, I'm a fan of the ephemera collections. Postcards, stereopticon views, artist files, matchboxes, business cards, trade catalogs, even 1930 grocery bills in the Hawks archive, a German design book for beads and buttons, and templates the designer sent to the glass blowers, specifying shape and thickness of the glass blank they're going to cut. I suspect there are a lot of us in this audience who have collections that we use for inspiration, things that intrigue or fascinate us and help us look more closely at our world. The key is to take that next step, to move from curiosity to looking more closely, from looking to problem solving. How might this curiosity be a part of your work? 
There are lots of books written about taking those next steps, and I won't go into them here. I really don't have a pattern or procedure that works consistently for me, so I thought I would give a recent example of working through an idea. And this is my most recent piece. I was given an antique iron, and I wanted to find a way to use it in sculpture. The local arts council posted a call for artists with the topic suffrage, and the iron seemed to be a perfect symbol for traditional women's work. Hot, heavy, exhausting, thankless, never-ending, but prettified by the elegant design of this iron. I looked for images of women ironing, or stories and poetry using iron, meaning as a metaphor, but I didn't have much luck. Then I explored suffrage and found Alice Drewer Miller's satiric list of reasons why women should not vote. Our own 12 anti-suffrage reasons was published in Miller's 1915 column in the New York Tribune. And I started imagining those words hanging from a clothesline and did a quick sketch, not trying to make it pretty. And actually I did several sketches and different ideas that I want to get back to. I had no time to flame work little skirts and shirts, so I used scraps of colored glass and abstract shapes and figured out how to transfer the words to the glass. And yet I wanted to shatter those <coughs> words, literally. I thought about broken glass shards surrounding the iron, but I wasn't satisfied. So I pulled out a bag of my mom's quilt scraps, tiny bits of calico, backed the glass with Mod Podge and fabric, and used a hammer to smash the glass, imbuing the sculpture with greater emotional impact. Step by step, incorporating each idea, solving each problem. It's not the original sketch, but it carries the concept further. I'm a proponent of sketching, quickly capturing an idea on paper, so I can come back and develop it especially those ideas that bud during the early morning hours when I'm reading poetry or a good novel or looking at art books in the library. This drawing is from the Raycal Research Library. Because I don't have a torch at home, although I do have a small kiln, and I have little time to work with hot glass, I usually go to the studio, sketches in hand, with something specific I want to work on. I also need time to just play on the torch but having a starting point seems to help me. It's like a writer facing a blank sheet of paper. An outline or the germ of an idea can be free. And I'm not creating artwork in my sketchbook. William Kirby Lockhart stated, there is a difference between paintings and drawings that are intended to be placed on the wall as artwork and those that are design drawings. Draw, designs are intended to communicate in a very specific way. While they can be beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, they're a middle step in the creation process, not the final result, not the creation itself. <coughs> For me, the act of sketching becomes a working out of ideas, transcribing shape and decoration as well as experimenting with technical and structural challenges on paper first. Caitlin Hyde wrote an excellent article expanding the visual concept through drawing about using design drawings in the Flow magazine a few years ago. So contact me if you'd like to see it. Which brings me to another source of inspiration, other artists' design drawings. And I've done lectures about the ways glass designers and artists capture their ideas on paper. Many use design drawings to communicate their ideas and their drawings allow a glimpse into the process of their making or becoming. Here are some favorite examples. This is Wiesner, you may know his cast work on the right. Take a look at the drawings from the 1960s. They're graphite rubbings, like you did as a school kid. But can't you feel the form, the texture, the weight of the finished object? A simple rubbing conveys the essence and the one in the middle looks like it was popsicle sticks. Wouldn't that be fun to, to make? This is Renee Lalique. It's an early design in the Raycal Library. 
and it's a fully realized design. But once the piece was in process, there could be changes. Compare the pearls, for example. The sketch shows several extra pencil marks altering the shape, but the pearl in the finished piece is quite different. The Carter Student Archive is filled with evidence of what Frederick Carter called looking for possibilities. Carter sketchbooks, which cover the period from 1880 to 1891, show his student work and assignments that record objects that he saw in museums. This is a later design oops, uh, for Pat de Verre that highlights his classical background. This design by Levinsky shows how the design would wrap around a bowl or vase. He generally created these designs for students to transfer and paint on glass. Was this an inspiration for my clothesline piece? Not deliberately, but I used this illustration in an article I wrote for Gas News, and I studied it closely last fall. So it's entirely possible um, that my mind was still referencing this compelling image. So it, ideas may come up weekly. Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka, father and son lamp workers, created glass models of sea creatures and botanicals. Theirs were working drawings, often spattered with coffee stains and burn marks. They've inspired a new generation of flame workers, including me. I created a piece for a Blaschka themed exhibit directly from their uh, drawings in the Ray Catalog. I'm also intrigued with artis artistic perception for a very personal reason. As I was researching perception for this talk, I found a line of study that proposes that artists see differently, sometimes by training and sometimes for physical reasons, including stereo blindness. It can be challenging to blow glass with poor eyesight, and I've struggled with the sight in my right eye since the 1980s. Just had my fourth cornea <coughs> transplant. And so thank you to anyone here who has signed up to be an organ donor. And I'm so grateful to the donor and the doctors who are restoring my sight. Constant changes in vision is disorienting. And it takes the mind a while to adjust. When my depth perception is off, it can be challenging to find the flame. And I made some really ugly beads at the Beads of Courage recording a few weeks ago. But people with limited depth perception may have an advantage as, as an artist. They must rely on other cues, such as shadows and occlusion, to navigate the world. So an artist with single eye vision may be better able to exploit these observations, make drawings and artwork that convey greater depth. And I learned so much from listening to artists or any creative person talk about what, how they see the world and the things that inspire them. CMOG initiated a new residency last year, the David White House Research Residency for Artists, is open to artists who want to utilize the museum's resources, including the permanent collection of glass and the holdings of the Raycal Research Lab. There are, it's not a making residency, there are no provisions to use the studio, but it gives artists the opportunity to deep dive into topics and further their knowledge or provide research for a project. And it's been really exciting for the librarians to see how our collections are used by artists and see the work through their eyes. Annie Cottrell was our first resident and her sculpture, The Source, created after she had time to absorb her experiences in the library, was intended to be a metaphor for life, what feeds, allows growth, and sustains the world. Listening to artists talk about their work is one of my favorite things. Learning about their thought processes and methods. I go to exhibit openings and artist talks every chance I get. Karen Lamont sh shared her prop studio with me and Eric Goldschmidt last night, and I was delighted to find a group of photos of Loie Fuller taped to her wall. 
Fuller danced with swirling silks and dramatic lighting, and she inspired an entire generation of Art Nouveau artists. And you can see the relationship to Karen's elegant sculpture with its lighting and drapery. And I love the way Jenny Ruffner thinks, turning reality upside down while convincing me that it's plausible. This is Jenny's piece, When Lightning Blooms, from her aesthetic engineering series. And she asked, what if lightning blossomed? What would it look like? Playing with that concept, Jenny developed this piece. Beads, are they just pretty baubles? They still express the interests, the personality, and the ideas of the artist. I love this title by Joyce Scott, Fearless Beadwork, Improvisational Payout Stitch. Tiny beads can make a difference, and Joyce uses her beadwork to make strong political statements. Like this one, Three Graces, Oblivious, While Los Angeles Burns. Liza Lu created this monumental sculpture, Continuous Mile, from 4.5 million sea beans in collaboration Whoa. with South African bee workers. Can you imagine? The bee is no longer a decorative element. It creates the sculptural form. And so many people want to touch this at the museum galleries. They actually had her create a small piece that people can go up and it is one of the popular pieces of the museum. So beads can tell a story. The story may be of your life, your worldview, your emotions, your love of nature and animals, experiences traveling, your attraction to color or pattern. But let your glass sing. I'm going to give you just a moment to think about where do your ideas come from? What would you like to do to develop your own creativity? Or perhaps think about a class you took this weekend, something that stimulated your ideas. And why are you an artist? So I'll be quiet for just a second. So what else may stimulate ideas or spark my ideas? Medieval reliquaries, precious boxes of metal and jewels, or glass, preserving sacred relics, preserving memories. My juice glass reliquary is filled with fragments of ancient glass, iridescent stuben, pyrex test tubes, test tubes, and more to commemorate 18 American flint glass workers union members killed in a railroad accident in Ravenna, Ohio in 1891. The monument you see in the background of the box is St. Mary's Cemetery in Corning, New York. I love 17th and 18th century landward figures and scenes from the Ver France and Alexander Calder's swirling golden lines and chunky glass jewelry. I also make some glass moments. The political situation today, this is hope with reference to Emily Dickinson's poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers. This is my first piece using engraving, the feathers engraved on a sandblasted mirror. And it's obvious that Joseph Cornell's collage or shadow boxes create a spark for me. They've been called poetry from ordinary objects. I've been applying to calls for artists, sending images of my jewelry, and would get the reply, I love your work, but I don't have a way to display it in my gallery. So more problem solving, I put my work in a frame or a box on the wall, and the pieces began to be accepted in uh, exhibits. Other used boxes as well, such as painted, painted shadow boxes by glass artists Jane Farrow and Fred Burkin. I am so lucky. I have easy access to historical objects, art magazines and books, plus manuscripts and rare books, going back to about 1150. It's well documented that libraries can be a rich source of inspiration for artists. So I have notebooks full of photocopies, antique jewelry, paintings, quotes, articles. 
maybe a bad librarian at home. They're not cataloged, they're not categorized, <laughs> certainly not alphabetical. But I squirrel them away. And when I'm in a dry period, looking for inspiration, hopefully I'll remember what popped the first time I saw that image or idea. When I see the same theme recur in my sketchbooks or notebooks, I know it's time to explore it more fully. Like a recurring dream, there's some deeper pattern or meaning that I need to explore. I'm also a note taker, and in the upcoming lectures that I'll attend with you, I'll be writing and sketching. I'm a kinesthetic and visual, so if I see the words or if I sketch the slides, I'm more apt to remember what was important about the presentation. It's sometimes useful to revisit, oops, there is 1150, the map of Calicula. And this is one of my favorite shapes. So quote, it can even be argued that you have an obligation to explore all possible variations, given that a single artistic question can yield many right answers. So this is one I've explored over and over through the years. I like the way that it kind of nestles around the collarbone. But it also refers to uh, the shape of Egyptian necklaces. This one's made of flowers. And most recently, I played with straight lines and round edges, with and without metal play. Life events prompt ideas. I moved to a new house a few years ago, leaving an apartment I'd loved for 18 years. Out my studio window, I watched a couple robins build a nest, patiently, wait patiently with the eggs, and finally feed their young. At the same time, I worked through the technical details of how to make this piece. And I realized that I had a lot of mixed emotions about the concept of home that were quietly expressed here and gradually made an unfamiliar place my own home. Even with all these sources of personal inspiration, it's easy for me to become anxious about making new work. So I'll keep making the same familiar thing over and over, or let work and home demands distract me from making anything at all. Self-doubts and fears are anti-inspirational for me. So when I feel a new rut coming on, I work through it by taking a yoga class, a walk in the neighborhood, working in the garden, talking and meditating with friends. They all help me recharge. I work with a wonderful coach who talked me through my anxiety over this talk, for example. And he is a painter, and he often quotes Robert Henri's book, The Art Spirit. One book I go back to over and over is Art and Fear, Observations of the Perils and Rewards of Art Making by David Bales and Ted Warland. And I sometimes turn to Jimmy Ruffner's pop-up book, Creativity, The Flowering Tornado for Encouragement. Her images are similar to my piece with Susan Plum. And Jimmy's message, avoid self-judgment, be aware of beauty, avoid the trap of fear, and act. So I've been working with hot glass for more than 30 years, and I'm still learning. The last time you invited me to speak at ISGB in 2013, I talked about the history of lamp working from ancient times to the present. Since then, <coughs> Eric Goldschmidt, Flameworker at CMON, and I joined forces to research and lecture on this topic. In 2017, we studied the museum's Nevere figures. The conservator emptied the gallery shelves so we could examine them under the microscope and try to determine how they were made. And then Eric actually tried to make them himself. Last year, we traveled to the Czech Republic and Germany to speak with educators, curators, and artists who still work with traditional methods. We filmed the artists as they demonstrated and interviewed them about their techniques in history. <coughs> so whether at home or abroad, I find there's always something new to learn about language. And if you keep learning, you keep finding new sources of inspiration. 
So here's where some of my some of my inspirations have led me. I explore line and gesture as wearable sculpture. I'm intrigued by sinuous art and bone lines. Tree branches silhouetted against the sky. Icicles and diagrams of old master paintings, where you can uh, gesture can carry your eye through the painting. My work conveys movement, flowing, organic, evoking the essence of natural forms. And I really enjoy the moment when glass is between being molten and frozen into shape, when it responds to my touch and the heat of the torch. I like contrast. Glass is associated with delicacy, fragility, even danger, sharp edges, breaking or shattering, but also the sparkling interplay of light. And frivolous jewelry can be almost too pretty. To wear a piece on stage at the Glass Art Society fashion shows, it must be powerful or strong enough to make an impact and move with a model. So I've worn these dresses over the years. This one's in New Orleans. Uh, this one's inspired by Egyptian necklaces and Tiffany headdress. My Toledo dress, inspired, uh, which is, I cut glass tubing to make uh, abstract shapes. My dragon dress, inspired by a dress in the wow. costume collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Wow. Can you believe that I floated in a gondola down the canal in, Atlanta, in my comedy and dell'arte dress? I was so much fun last year. I work with metals. I work with metals first as a way to make sophisticated findings for my jewelry, then as an alternate means of exploration and expression. Some pieces are based on traditional or historical jewelry like Cascade, which was inspired by a locket chain, a Swedish 18th century wedding locket. The combination of hanging ornaments, hard imagery, and cascading chains was popular with peasant brides. I transformed this pendant from a Victorian shape to a more contemporary style. And here's my Egyptian one. I like others to find their own associations or stories. In this piece, some see icicles, antlers, a river, even lightning or cracks in the sidewalk. Each of us has a personal symbolism, a battered antique clock, a seedling, waterfall or leaves and vines may evoke associations and meaning. I combine elements like these into wall sculptures let each person respond to them. And often, the sculpture offers a more intimate experience, a chance to extract a piece as jewelry. So this is from a trickle where the glass stalactite hangs as a pendant. And as if, if time is running out, so does the twining ivy. You can remove and wear the pendulum in the clock. Nature and landscape. The accident of found objects. Time, <coughs> balance, and the concept of home. I've become part of telling my story. This piece, entitled Breathing Carefully, where the seed, silver seedling becomes a ring, was inspired by a poem by Edward Duncan. Quote, I think of cornflower seeds, which breathe into the dark of their packets in the store. Although they need light, the seeds would burn up if we threw them into the sun. But hidden in the soil, separated from the light, they sprout. They emerge like hands, heels together, palms up, ready to catch moisture, light, and the whole breathing world. To funnel it down into the roots, just beginning to reach out. Sometimes when I'm breathing careful, 